This is part of this grand uh, hope program that we have to take the microphysical laws of fundamental reality and connect them with the manifest world that we see around us of the human scale world. So for example, in particular, uh, all right thinking people think that the fundamental laws of physics are reversible and deterministic. And nevertheless, the world that we see around us seems to have asymmetries in time. There are many of these. Uh, the one I'm gonna be focusing on today is that of causality. So when we swing our elbow and we knock a wine glass onto the floor, it seems very, very natural for us to say, the reason why the wine glass fell is because I swung my arm. It would seem very unnatural for us to say, the reason I swung my arm is because the wine glass was going to fall. So what is the fundamental reason why that asymmetry exists? And also, why is it that when you search Google for images of wine glasses being knocked over, it's always cats that are knocking things over, not human beings. So this is the only image I could find of a human being. And I will confess this talk is somewhat sketchy and aspirational. I have an FQXI grant to study these things. Sadly, that does not imply that the study has been completed by the time of the FQXI conference. So will there be some parts that are talking about things I would like to understand but don't quite yet understand? So, oh, and people have think, thought about this before um, in various different ways. I will not actually be citing any of them in the talk, so here's the credit I'm giving to them now. As you all know, because you were probably at the FQXI conference whew, eight years ago uh, that, that traveled from Bergen to Copenhagen, there's something called the arrow of time, which is explained because entropy is increasing. Boltzmann, on the equation on his tombstone, figured out what entropy is. It's the number of ways of counting the number of different microstates that correspond to a different macrostate. And we explain the arrow of time in the macroscopic world by two things. Number one, there are more ways to be high entropy than to be low entropy. So if you start in a low entropy state, it's very natural to evolve to a high entropy state. And number two, for some unknown reason, we started in a low entropy state. That's the past hypothesis that puts us there. So we can, that's a very natural setup. We don't understand why we started in a low entropy state. That's what I was studying a few years ago. Today, we wanna to think about all of the ramifications of the fact that entropy is increasing. People like me believe that the fact that entropy is increasing is behind all of the different asymmetries of time in our real world, including cause and effect, but also memory and things like that. And I'll talk a little bit about memory. So the difference, in other words, I wanna mention that physicists have abrogated the world word causality to mean something completely different, right? In our everyday lives, we actually have quite a subtle notion of causality. Why is something true? Tracing out the actual reasons why something happened is a, can be a subtle thing. Physicist just means everything moves slower than the speed of light. That is what they mean by the word causality, that there are light cones and all physical influences travel inside light cones. So this is a rare example where the person on the street has a more nuanced definition of the word than the professional physicist. So I'm actually talking about the nuanced definition of the word, not the physicist definition. And to set this up, uh, I will give away the answer first and then try to go back and formalize it a little bit mathematically. So here is, uh, we're, we're talk, we can talk in the same language both about causality and about memory. Here is a record or an event or something that is going on in the present world. You see an egg broken on the sidewalk. And those, I think I actually used this exact picture eight years ago in, uh, in Bergen. The question is, what can we infer about the world from the existence of this egg broken on the sidewalk? Well, in terms of the future of the egg, there's plenty of possibilities. It could just sit there for a while, someone could clean it up, dog could come around and eat it. But in terms of the past, with overwhelming probability, you would say, I bet there used to be an unbroken egg and someone dropped it and it broke. So why is it that we can be so much more specific about the past of the egg than the future of the egg? And the answer is not in the fundamental laws of physics. Given what we know about the present, the number of possible futures is exactly the same as the number of possible pasts, if you believe in microscopic reversibility. But you also have this low entropy past hypothesis. And given that, conditionalizing on that, you can infer things about the past trajectory. So given the egg lying there broken on the ground, if you had no other information, it probably just randomly assembled itself from the chaos of the surrounding universe. But given that we started with a low entropy Big Bang, it probably came from an unbroken egg. That's an enormously powerful conclusion that we get, and we think it's, that's how it works. Filling in the details is exactly what we're about today. 
So uh, plenty of people have tried to fill in the details. We're just going to try to be a little bit more mathy about it. So we're formalizing what we're doing here. We start with a space of states for the whole universe, capital omega, and there's a particular coordinate, a particular state we're in, capital Q, and that evolves with time. And there's no arrows here, or there's arrows both ways on time, because we're assuming the fundamental laws of physics are reversible and deterministic. I was kidding before, of course. There are plenty of somewhat sensible people who worry that the fundamental laws of physics are not perfectly deterministic, but I'm just not one of them. So let's assume for today's talk that they are. And then what we do is to take this pristine, beautiful, formal structure and kind of mess it up by going to approximations that involve coarse graining and subsystems and things like that. So you take the whole system, the universe as a whole, for example, you divide it up into some little subsystems. They have their individual coordinates. And then you further, within each subsystem, little omega alpha, you talk about macro variables x alpha and micro variables y alpha. So for example, a classic example would be the Earth moving around the sun. The Earth has a lot of particles in it. I forget the number, 10 to the 50th or something like that. But to figure out the trajectory of the Earth around the sun, you do not need to follow the position and momentum of every particle in the Earth. All you need to do is imagine that there is a center of mass coordinate that has a position and a velocity, and that's enough. So there's 10 to the 50th other numbers that you don't need to know. So the macro variables in that case are just the center of mass. The micro variables are all the relative positions and velocities of the particles inside. Parenthetically, let me remark that this situation is extremely non-generic. Ordinarily, in most physical situations, if you throw away some fraction of the microscopic data, you can make zero predictions about what's going to happen macroscopically. This is a case of emergence where you only need a tiny amount of data to do really, really good predictions. So we're going to imagine there are somehow some coarse graining, as Boltzmann imagined, that gives us a set of macro variables, and then there's micro variables inside. And this is, I'm going to make an assumption here that will be useful for me, and this is exactly the, the kind of thing that the work is still in progress, asking what are the simplest, most robust assumptions that we really need to make. So we have a probability distribution over the microstates. We don't imagine we have perfect knowledge. We're not Laplace's demon. We know some things and not others. So that obviously can be written as a probability distribution over the macro variables and micro variables of our subsystems. We can turn that into a probability distribution just over the macro variables by marginalizing over the micro variables. If we knew all the micro variables, if we were Laplace's demon, we could just track our probability distribution over time. And even if Laplace's demon only knew a probability distribution, it would be able to track that probability distribution exactly, and the entropy would not increase. Liouville's theorem would say that you know the same amount about the system at all times, whether that amount is infinity or some fraction of that, okay? But if all we're given is information about the macro variables, and that we know that those macro variables start in a low entropy state, they keep interacting with the micro variables, and therefore their entropy is going to increase, and therefore, we can we imagine that there is a difference between what's going on in the macro and micro scales. The physics assumption I'm going to make is that the micro variables interact with each other rapidly. And so they tend to equilibrate very, very fast. So the example we have in mind is you could imagine the Earth and its center of mass, or you can imagine like the cream and coffee mixing into each other. So you have cream molecules, coffee molecules, and this idealization, and you have a macroscopic configuration which just tells you this image. The macroscopic configuration is just how much cream and coffee fraction do you have at every little point in space. There are many, many microstates that correspond to any macrostate. The assumption is that the macro variables increase in entropy, but slowly. You can see them increasing in entropy as the cream and coffee mix together. But for every macro state, the micro variables equilibrate very, very fast. So even if all you know is that most of the cream is up there, most of the coffee is down there, the individual cream and coffee molecules in that configuration are going to be close to something like a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. So that might not be the most elegant assumption to make, but I think it's indicative of the fact that you need a little bit of physics in here to make progress here. It's not going to be purely advancing with logic and statistics.
So what do we do with that? Well, given that, given that assumption that the microvariables are almost always in equilibrium, you can ask what the macrovariables do, and you can get a, an evolution equation that is dissipative, a master equation or something like that. And using that, if you start the macro variables, so let's say the configuration of cream and coffee, you can figure out, given only that macro information, how it evolves in time. And as many of you know, if you start at some moment, let's say you start in the middle here, and someone gives you the probability distribution over the macro variables, it will evolve into configurations of increasing entropy, both to the past and the future if all we're using are the fundamental evolution laws and the fact that our macro variables are coupled to some fast-moving micro variables, okay? So this is the problem for someone like Boltzmann. If you didn't know about the past hypothesis, if you start in a low entropy configuration, you, you infer similar things about the past and the future, namely that we are right now today at a point of minimum entropy in the history of the universe. Nobody in their right mind thinks that's true, which is why you have to introduce the past hypothesis. The past hypothesis, the name was given by David Albert, says that for some reason, some cosmological reason, there was a low entropy condition very, very early on. And people will debate exactly what is the best formulation of the past hypothesis, but we won't need any of those details today. But the point is, rather than starting with the universe today and using your evolution equations to go forward and backward in time, start at the beginning of the universe in a low entropy condition and march in one direction of time, which we will then call toward the future, okay? So this is where the time asymmetry comes in, not from the fundamental laws, but from a postulate about the form of the evolution of the probability distribution at early times, okay? So this is an assumption, it is a hypothesis, we could be fooled by an evil demon, but it is an assumption that is consistent with what we see about the universe. When we look at the universe, look at the cosmic microwave background, it appears to be in a low entropy state. We assume that we're not being fooled when that's what we see. And what we can conclude from that is that in this picture, where we start with a low entropy early condition for the macro variables and march forward in time, that evolution is Markovian, by which I mean at any one time step, I can determine what the macroscopic probability distribution is just from knowing what it was at the earlier time step. So if I want to know what the probability distribution at time two is, it would be sufficient to know what it was at time one. I don't need to know what it was at time zero. And the only way I can get to that conclusion is from this assumption of local equilibration. Otherwise, there could be sneaky conspiracies in the distribution so that entropy could go up for a little while and then go back down again. So by assuming that the microscopic variables equilibrate very quickly, basically I'm erasing from the macro state any possible such uh, sneaky things going on, and therefore the evolution just proceeds from step to step. Even though I assume that there's a past hypothesis to get the program off the ground, I don't need to keep marginalizing or conditionalizing over it to get through the, my day. That's why when you see an egg broken on the floor and you try to infer the existence of an unbroken egg in the past, you don't really need to think about the Big Bang, okay? You're secretly using the Big Bang to justify it, but you don't really need to know much about the details there. So this is a very useful setup, and we can actually uh, get some information from it, but now we need to start asking more detailed questions about what does it mean to say that something is caused by something else. So I'm going to go through some wrong answers here. All right, here's our setup. This is our uh, macroscopic probability distribution evolving over time. This is just a little formula that says I can always marginalize to get individual probability distributions for any little subset of that graph. And you might guess, well, maybe the, the answer to the question, does X31 cause X42? Well, you might say, let's look for correlations between these probabilistic random variables. So the correlations are captured by the mutual information. You can calculate the entropy of any subset of the graph, and then the mutual information between any two nodes of the graph. And maybe if they're tightly correlated, then you say that one causes the other. But that's obviously not quite what we want because mutual information is symmetric with respect to the two things. It, it says that there's a correlation with what happens at that node and that node, but it doesn't direct us from one to the other. So it can't really answer the question, what is causing what else? 
Likewise, the other thing you might want to do is conditionalize on the value of some variable. You might say, well, when this variable takes on a certain value, then this variable will take on another value with some high probability. But likewise, that kind of thing works both forwards and backwards in time. Even if it's not symmetric, it's also not time-directed in the right way. It's just another way of talking about the correlations between the variables. So these are very useful information theoretic quantities, but they are not exactly answering the question, when does one event cause another event to happen? So uh, what we do have is given to us by Judea Pearl. This is one version of causality. And he says, consider a directed acyclic graph. So consider some random variables, the probability you have certain genetic uh, components in your DNA, the probability that you're a smoker, and the probability that you get cancer. So this is a true statement that when you, get, when you smoke, you're more likely to get cancer, but people in the 60s and 70s who were highly compensated for doing so said maybe it's not smoking that causes cancer, maybe there's a genetic component that causes you to both smoke and get cancer. Those were the days when scientists could really earn a buck for doing probabilistic analysis. And what you want to know is, okay, is it realistic to say that it's the genetic component that's causing both, or does smoking really cause cancer? And what Pearl did was invent this way of taking the variable you care about, the smoking variable, and isolating it by what he calls a do operator. So he defines a probability distribution for the rest of the graph, in this case just x and z, which fixes the value of what y is. And the way you do it is, for what y is, remember this is smoking, you define the parents of that variable in the graph, which are all the variables with arrows pointing toward y, and you sort of rid the dependence, you break the connection between x and y, between the variable and its parents. And then once you've broken that connection, you have a remaining probability distribution for your genetic components and your probability of getting cancer. And then you say, if in that new subgraph, if different values of y imply different probabilities for getting cancer, then you can indeed say that smoking causes cancer. That's what it means to say that y causes z, that when you have this little subgraph and you impose a value on y, breaking its dependence on its parents, there is still an influence of y on z. Okay? In that analysis, there's no arrow of time anywhere. He's just thinking of things that you know to be true, your genes, your DNA, uh, your smoking, your cancer. Can we derive somehow that causes are always going to happen before the effects? And the happy news is that if you b buy everything I've already told you, the answer is trivially yes. It actually is one of these things, it's a lot of work to set up the formalism, deriving the result is very easy. The question is that we have this big probability distribution, but there's no arrows on it, right? So is it true that this is one of Pearl's directed acyclic graphs? So what you have to do is look back up on Wikipedia or in Pearl's textbook, what is the definition of a directed acyclic graph or a Bayesian network? And the answer is when the probability distribution for all of the different subnodes can be written as the product of what it would be only depending on its parents, okay? So the parents, if you wanted to put arrows here, if the arrows are going from left to right, then you know that x41 has parents x30 and x40. If you can reconstruct the whole graph just from knowing the dependence of every variable on its parents, then you can put the arrows on. Then it's a Bayesian network, a directed acyclic graph. But that's true for our graph. You can put those arrows on exactly because the evolution of the macro probability distribution is Markovian. Exactly because I can figure out what's going on at this moment in time just from what happened at the previous moment of time. If I also needed the past hypothesis at every single step, I wouldn't be able to do it. Or if I needed to know what happened in the future to know what's happening now, I wouldn't be able to do it. But because of this Markovian property of the probability distribution, we were able to say that indeed, this is a direct acyclic graph, the arrows point from left to right, therefore causes precede effects. And basically the physics here is that if someone gives you a glass of cool water in a world where entropy is increasing, you don't know whether it came from a glass of warm water with an ice cube or a glass of cool water by itself. There's irreversibility and information is lost in the, in, in the evolution. And that is in fact the reason why causes precede effects. So that's a happy little conclusion.
Now there's much more to be done here, and one of the things to be done is understanding the difference between having a memory of something in the past and knowing what the past is just from retrodicting it, right? So I can look at the positions of the planets and the moon and so forth, and I can give you the times of all the lunar eclipses millions of years in the past. It's not because I have a memory of them. It's not because I have a photograph, right? So what is the difference between this idea of a memory and the idea of a retrodiction. So here's a memory. This is a picture of my cat, Ariel, and I know what time it is because my iPhone kept the timing. So from this data, I know that Ariel was on the bookshelf at 5.48 p.m. at that time, okay? Without this picture, I would not know that. I would not be able to infer that. This is a prediction for what will happen tomorrow based on celestial mechanics. The sun will rise at a certain time tomorrow morning. What's the difference between them? And the answer is, I think, and I haven't seen any discussion of this, but maybe I just haven't seen it, it, re it has to do with how the macro variables themselves evolve. It has to do with the nature of the emergent theory for the macro variables. Sometimes, like for the center of mass coordinate of a planet, the macro variables themselves evolve deterministically. In that case, you can predict and retrodict perfectly well. But in other cases, the macro variables evolve at best stochastically. You don't know exactly what's going to happen. The best you can do is assign probabilities to do it. Whether a volcano will erupt, what choices I'm going to make about my future life, what car I'm going to buy, things like that. So when that's true, when the macro variables necessarily evolve stochastically, the best you can do is appeal once again to the past hypothesis and your current knowledge of the system to infer this trajectory going backward in time. Then you can assign a memory here because you're saying that the only reason why I can say what happened here is because I'm conditionalizing on both the past and the present. I would like to understand that much better than I do right now, but I'm optimistic that we can actually attach equations to all these things that philosophers have told us are true for quite a while now. Thank you.